The following story that Rachel is going to be reading is about a unique Kiwi Christmas written by renowned New Zealand author Joy Cowley. There is no snow in it, but there is a fish. Rachel? All right. I said I'd tell you about the fish. Well, summer was early that year, and there was no going into town on Christmas Eve because of the hay, you see. Mum was driving the tractor, Dad was on the trailer, and us five kids were helping Uncle Pete load. Hard work in the heat, bales like big wheat bicks tied with green twine. We had tough hands, but the string still cut, and there were thistles to be dug out of fingers. Boy, were we pleased to see Uncle Pete's wife, Auntie Roimata, bouncing across the paddocks on her motorbike. It was a BSA Bantam with a spring clip on the carrier and a box with two flagons of lemon cordial and some sandwiches, and I forget what, what else. No, not the fish, I'm coming to that. So we all sat in the macrocarpa shade, us kids still moaning about town. It was the shopping, you see. We hadn't bought anything for mum and dad. The tree was up in the bay window. We'd made our own decorations. Ping pong balls painted with glitter, silver bells from milk bottle tops, crepe paper streamers. But what about the presents? It was all right for our parents. They'd got stuff for us kids weeks before. We'd seen the parcels at the back of the garage. It was them who were gonna miss out. I said we should all drive into town when the hay was finished, but mum said we'd be too tired. Forget it, said dad. Getting the hay in the barn's the best present you could give us. Uncle Pete and Auntie Roy said, yeah, yeah, too right. But they didn't understand how us kids felt. You couldn't put hay under the tree with a card. Merry Christmas, Mum and Dad. They were spot on, though, about us being tired. We didn't get the last bales in until dark, and by then we were just about asleep on our feet. If I remember rightly, I didn't even get in my pyjamas. The fish? No, I haven't forgotten about the fish. We are coming to that. I guess we woke up early. Kids always do, don't they? Our toys were by the tree and they were corker. Mum and Dad had gone around the auction mart, bought secondhand stuff and cleaned it up. I got a toolkit with real tools and a pump action oil can. The others had a bike, scooter, cricket set and music box. Mum got some of us to help her pod the peas. My sisters sang, while well, shepherds washed their socks by night, all sheeted on the ground. A cake of life boy soap came down and soap suds splashed around. Mum told them off. She wasn't really mad. It was when she opened the meat safe that she got upset. No fridge in those days, you see. And with the hot weather, the leg of lamb for Christmas dinner was as high as a kite. It smelled like it had been lying in the paddock for three weeks. Poor mum. She threw the stinking meat out to the dogs and said, that's it, that's it, I give up. Dad put his arms around her. He'd kill another sheep, he said. He'd shoot a couple of ducks. We could have dinner later. But mum wouldn't cheer up. While they were talking, there was a knock on the back door. I went out. There in the porch was this little kid with a sugar sack in his arms. Honest, he could hardly hold it. His skinny brown legs were bowed with the weight. I waited for him to say something. He didn't. We just looked at each other. Then he pushed the sack at me. For your mum and dad, he said. I tell you, I nearly dropped it. There was something inside, heavy, kind of floppy. The kid walked backwards across the veranda, then turned and ran over the paddocks. I put the sack down and opened it. Yes, it was the fish, a huge thing, blue and silver, still wet and smelling of the sea. <laughs> you should have seen my mother. Dad, too. They couldn't believe it. Dad thought the boy was someone staying with Pete and Roimata and he phoned to thank them. Uncle Pete said he didn't know anything about it. 
Come off it, ma'am, he said. You'd think if I got a fish like that, I'd give it away. So we never find, found out who the kid was or where the big fish came from. Like I said, it was fresh caught and the sea was more than 30 miles away. All I know is we had a 14 pound snapper with peas and new potatoes from the garden and it was the best Christmas dinner I ever tasted. Thank you, Rachel. Our next carol recounts the first celebration of Christmas in New Zealand, 207 years ago tonight. Folklore says that its composer, Willow Mackey, sang it for the first time in our church. Te Hari Nui. Many of you know it, so feel free to sing along. John will now insert some Kiwi humor into our festivities, reading or singing if he wishes, uh, iconic comedian Fred Dagg's version of We Three Kings. Are you gonna sing it, John? I will bless you all with not hearing my singing. <laughs> We three kings of Orient are, one in a tractor, two in a car, one on a scooter, tooting his hooter, following yonder star. Oh, oh, star of wonder, star of light, star of beauty, she'll be right, star of glory, that's the story, following yonder star. Thank you, John. Fred would be proud. <laughs> Our next carol, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, was written by Unitarian Minister Edward Sears in 1849. Sears' context was the social strife that plagued America as the Civil War approached. He focuses not on the birth of Jesus, but the message of the angels. Peace and goodwill to all. Now to a world still a world still torn by strife. Let us listen to and act like the angels. The King James Bible translates the Persian word magi as wise men. But in truth, the Magi and the Persian court were both men and women. So it might have been in truth three wise women who followed the star. And now I invite Rachel to read Norma Farber's The Queen's Came Late. The Queen's came late, but the Queen's were there with gifts in their hands and crowds, crowns in their hair. They'd come, these three, like the kings from far, following, yes, that guiding star. They'd left their ladles, linens, looms, their children playing in nursery rooms, and told their sisters, take charge, for this is a marvellous sight we must not miss. The queens came late, but not too late, to see the animals small and great, feathered and furred, domestic and wild, gathered to gaze at a mother and child. And rather than frankincense and myrrh and gold for the babe, they brought for her, who held him, a homespun gown of blue and chicken soup with noodles too, and a lingering, lasting cradle song. The queens came late, and stayed not long, for their thoughts already were straining far, past manger and mother and guiding star, and a child aglow as the morning sun, toward home and children and chores undone. Thank you, Rachel. 
Thank you, Rachel. One of the most important question, questions at Christmas time is what gift to bring. This year, my gift to bring to my wife, Rachel, is one of her favorite songs. But this version is a little different. Little Drummer Boy. Well, I promised it was different. Should I take it back to the store? <laughs> For those of us who are expats from the Northern Hemisphere, and miss snow at Christmas. John DeLeo will read the Christmas blizzard, or a portion of it, by Garrison Keeler. I like John so much to give him this re reading, because I love reading it. But have fun with it, John. Thank you, Clay. His phone rang. It was his cousin Liz in Loose Leaf, North Dakota. Do you have a minute? She said. What is it? You're in a rush. I can hear it. Listen, I'll send you a text message. Just tell me what's wrong. It's nothing important, so don't get all head up. About what? Listen, Jimmy, I can tell I've upset you. I'll call back when you settle down. What's going on? So you didn't hear about daddy? Okay, um, so you didn't hear about daddy. All right, what about Uncle Earl? I shouldn't even say, he didn't want you to know. Know what? It's nothing, he's old, everything comes to an end. There are no guarantees, we'll deal with it. You've got enough to worry about. Tell me what's going on, Liz. I shouldn't have said anything. He had to go to the hospital on Tuesday. What's wrong? Daddy told me not to call you because he knew you'd be upset. I'm sorry I opened my big mouth. James took the phone in his right hand and whacked the table with it four, five, six times, and then said, Liz, if you don't stop beating around the bush, I'm going to fly up there and give you a Dutch rub. Remember the Dutch rubs, Liz? It stings. I can make you cry. His left eyeball fell out, said Liz. His eyeball fell out? It was only his left one. He was watching the Lawrence Welk Christmas special on TV, and Bobby and Betty did a beautiful tap dance to Oh Holy Night, and Daddy got weepy and rubbed his eye, and it just fell out. It was hanging by the optic. He has skin cancer and it spread to his eyes, but they popped it right back in. He's, he's fine, no problem. He didn't want me to call you and bother you. Oh my God. Anyway, could you call him and cheer him up a little? You know, he thinks the sun rises and sets on you and he still talks about the time you flew out for, here for his birthday. When was that, 10 years ago? Anyway, you mean the world to him and frankly, I shouldn't say this, but I don't know as he'll make it to Christmas. And then she broke down and cried and hung up. Not like Liz to fall apart like that, she being a member of the National Rifle Association and all. That's how James Sparrow, successful Chicago CEO, who would rather go to Hawaii and forget about Christmas, ends up flying to Loose Leaf, North Dakota only to be stuck there in a Christmas blizzard. And of course, that's where he learns the true meaning of Christmas, in a fishing hut, on a frozen lake, when an old Chinese man tells him what a difference in the universe his trip to North Dakota made. The old Chinese man says, your trip to Loose Leaf has resulted in much good you have cheered up your uncle who was descending toward death and is now having a last encore of 
pleasure before he leaves. When will he die? said James. Tuesday. And you made peace with your cousin, whom you dislike. And you fought your other cousin to a draw. And that was good for her soul to be withstood. She had it all her way for most of her life. And now there's a little hole in her roof and she can view the sky. Any way you can offer a fellow being a new prospect is a kindness. But the loveliest was your $20 tip for Mert, who was embarrassed by the generosity and meant to run after you and give it back. But the truth is, she is short on cash. And there is nothing shameful about need, nor about what satisfies it. We give and we take. She takes your money, which she needs, to buy a Frank Sinatra CD, Songs for Lovers, and a pack of camels and a bottle of beer for her old Aunt Lois, who needs to feel 26 again and dancing at the Spanish Gardens Ballroom in Santa Barbara with Jack McCloskey, the textile salesman, and her first true love, the night they necked in his pink convertible with the night breeze rich with eucalyptus and palm. And though she knew he was not long for her arms, still he was gentle and sweet to her and told her he loved her over and over as he made love to her, which at 26, she had never experienced before. And so this was a revelation that despite the sarcasm of her sisters and the harsh remarks of her mother, Lois could be loved. And now, years later, listening to Mr. Sinatra and smoking a cigarette in her upstairs bedroom, she will call up Jack, who is 78 years old and in poor health in a care center in Provo, Utah, which Mert located via the internet. And Aunt Lois will tell Jack McCloskey that the memory of that January night remains a lamp in her heart. And this kind word, after years and years of sodden despair, will illuminate his night and move him to finally and absolutely sign over his wealth to the Jeremiah program for single mothers and thereby vast goodness will be achieved. The old Chinese man smiled for the first time in his monologue. <clears throat> See what you've done, Mr. Sparrow? More than you know. What about Christmas, James asks. What about it? It's a nice day. Take a long walk, sing more, and talk less. Thank you, John. One of the perks of planning a service is I get to choose a hymn that I want to hear, or a song. And so our next song uh, is one of my favorites, Carol of the Bells. Now it is time for our traditional candlelight portion of the service. Unfortunately, we can't all line up around the outside of the church and light each other's candles, except virtually. But if you have a candle, this would be a good time to have it. And if you have a candle, light it now. Let us be still in the darkness of our sacred space and listen to the quiet around us. For even in the quiet, there is a, the gentle being with others. Let us feel the warmth of our community, knowing we are not alone. 
For in the quiet shadow is a glow of life within all. Let us know in the darkness the gift each candle bears. A small flame, a diminutive light, yet the wondrous gift to kindle another's glow. Let us be in awe at this moment as we each take up the flame, as we hope for peace and goodwill that it may fill this night. Normally, at this point, we sing that ancient hymn, Carol, Silent Night, in English. But tonight, I thought we might listen to it in Toreo. My closing words for tonight are tonight in this community. We have shared stories, listened to carols, opened our hearts to the beauty of music, Tonight, we have turned to one another, virtually lighting each other's candles in the dark. Tonight, we have dared to hear a message of hope, spoken once again challenging against the challenge of the world. It's now time to depart, to go forward, to live our lives and to the world. May joy be your companion, whether you are with others or alone. May love be your strength, and may the gift of community dwell in your hearts. And of course, it wouldn't be proper to not wish you a Merry Christmas.